Over the last few weeks in our series in the book of Hebrews, we've been considering the opening of chapter 11, the great chapter on faith, which comes directly on the heels of the writer's exhortation to the Hebrews to patiently and confidently endure as pilgrims in the wilderness. And he tells them this very thing in the very end of chapter 10, which comes right before our text today. In chapter 10, starting in verse 34, the writer of Hebrews exhorts them and reminds them, saying, You knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. There it is. This endurance with confidence focused on the better and abiding or remaining possession, that which is promised, in direct connection with the coming of Christ himself, as the Old Testament, Old Testament text cited proves. All of that together is faith. The very faith which he goes on to define in chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, chapter 11 is not a standalone chapter. But it is the very encouragement, the very medicine, the very exhortation, the very word, the balm that those to whom he is writing need because they are suffering or have suffered. Their properties have been plundered and they're losing confidence. Some are considering throwing in the towel, being done and going back to their old way of life which in Hebrews is the types and shadows instead of the substance. They're discouraged. They're losing heart. They're about to give up. And as a result, this pastor, a good pastor who knows the condition of his sheep, he encourages, warns, and exhorts them to press on in faith, the very faith of their fathers, the righteous, who likewise suffered greatly, living as pilgrims and exiles in this world, and defining and modeling this faith, which he is exhorting them to have, is the purpose of chapter 11. Now in chapter 11, 1, we've seen that he begins by teaching us that faith is directly connected to hope and things unseen. In fact, he tells us that faith is, in the present, right now, assurance. It's confidence in light of things hoped for. It is a present conviction in light of things unseen. And therefore, it's no leap into the dark. It is confidence, as John Murray says. And because of this definition... Faith connected to hope and the unseen, we've come to the conclusion that faith is directly connected, therefore, to the revelation of God. Specifically, his word, which is now inscripturated for, for us in our Bibles. Because the hope that we are to be sure of in the present and the things unseen, which we are to see with the eyes of faith, with conviction... These are not subjective realities that we create for ourselves. This hope is not a self-created hope that we envision for ourselves. But instead, these hope for and unseen realities, including the very existence of God, according to 11.3, all of this can only be known and then hoped for through God's revelation on account of God's revelation. There is no such thing as hope and things unseen apart from God's word. That's where they get their substance and their meaning. And therefore, this hope and things unseen, which we are to live in light of right now, with assurance and conviction, these are things that God has revealed to his people 
and then inscripturated that we might have assurance and confidence in light of these things in the present, and that is faith. And therefore, faith, in a wide and generic sense, is as simple as taking God at his word. It believes that the word is from God, and therefore it believes that word with confidence. But once we see that faith cannot ever exist apart from God's word and revelation, once we see that faith is taking God at his word, we now understand why Hebrews is so concerned about God's revelation, especially its unfolding and its climactic fulfillment in the Son, the Word made flesh. And that's what I want us to focus on today. I want us to see as we step back and take a bird's eye view instead of pressing on verse by verse with our systematic expositional preaching. I want to step back and see how this definition of faith, connecting faith and the revelation of God, fits with the book as a whole beginning with faith generally considered and then moving to faith specifically considered. And I'll explain what that means as we come to it. And I think what we'll see is that this connection between faith and the word or revelation of God is not something that begins in Hebrews 11, but in fact, it is central in Hebrews from start to finish. In fact, I am convinced that it is the fundamental issue that the writer is dealing with in the book. The revelation of God has come to its climax, and we have two options. Receive it by faith or reject it, and there is no neutrality. That is the point of the book as it centers around Jesus Christ. Now, if you understand this, this connection between the revelation of God and faith, taking God at his revelation or at his word, then we understand why the book of Hebrews opens the way it does. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, the writer says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke, that's his revelation, to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken more revelation to us by his son. You see, from the beginning of the book, the first verse out of the gate, the emphasis in Hebrews is on God speaking. The emphasis is on God's revelation. Before the incarnation of the Son, God speaks at many times and in many ways to our fathers. And how were the fathers to respond to this speech, this word revelation from God? I think it's clearly implied. They were to respond to God speaking at many times and in many ways by faith. And that's precisely what Hebrews 11 lays out for us, showing us examples of that faith, which takes God at his word. Hebrews 11 teaches us that our fathers of old, who were the recipients of that revelation at many times and in many ways, they were commended for their faith, 11.2 as they responded properly to God's revelation, his word, believing what he required they believed, and then doing as the fruit of faith what he required them to do, all as his revelation came forth at many times and in many ways. And those who didn't believe this revelation of God, what of them? They perished in the wilderness. And the glaring example in the Old Testament of that is Israel, an entire generation who falls in the wilderness because they did not receive God's revelation by faith. And therefore, from the beginning, as he emphasizes revelation, which demands a response, we already see that the the revelation of God is emphasized and the only commendable response is faith. But this speaking in many times and in many ways long ago, the earlier revelation was just the beginning because the revelation of God was progressive 
It was unfolding. It was moving towards a goal. It was moving towards the fullness of time. When in the fullness of time, God would not speak at many times and in many ways, but in a son, who we now know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God who became man, our prophet, priest, and king, our savior. And the assumption is this word from the same God to the same people regarding the same grace and salvation, the same blessed future hope is to be received by what? The same faith, which has been commended throughout the ages. Just like the fathers of old took God at his word in regard to all that he said and promised, like Abraham, the great example, lifted up numerous times. Like that, so also we, or to follow in the footsteps of our fathers, the great cloud of witnesses, receiving and believing the most mature revelation as it comes to us in the Son and then through his apostles. And if not, there are serious consequences. Wrath and judgment are threatened against all who would reject this revelation in unbelief. And we see these warnings all throughout Hebrews. But one we haven't seen yet is in chapter 12. Verse 25, where the author says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him, and therefore his speaking, his revelation, who warns from heaven. So it's clear from the beginning of the book that God speaks, he reveals, and his revelation is to be received and believed. They are to have faith, receiving and believing all of it. And those who do not receive this revelation of God are judged. They perish. And the author, I think, has a very specific revelation in view that he is pointing out time and time again. He teaches us, yes, about the unfolding of redemptive history. That's what he means by many times and many ways in verse 1 of chapter 1. He teaches us that God's revelation is progressive and it moves towards a goal. But it's that specific goal that he has in mind in the book. His goal is to help us see how all of God's revelation from the beginning which is to be received by faith, is moving toward a specific goal. And that specific goal is a person, Jesus Christ. He is the great fact to be interpreted, as Voss would say. This goal in the author's mind is why the entire book is really one building, climaxing, continuous argument for the supremacy of the Son as the climactic fulfillment of all of God's revelation to us. He is the Word, the Word incarnate. And so his point in the book is that all previous revelation, as God has spoken, has been paving the way for this very moment, this very person and work. Jesus and his work. And Jesus himself teaches us this. He says in Luke 24, 44, he says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You see, Jesus here tells us that he is the point he is the climactic revelation of God. And all previous revelation, the revelation found in the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Tanakh, which is a summary of all the Old Testament, all of that has been driving to him. And therefore, because that's true, from the beginning of the book, as he unfolds the revelation of God and teaches us how to understand it, from the beginning, he labors to show us how the old gives way to the new. How the old was forward-looking, 
with its sacrifices, prophets, priests, kings, all the promises, types, shadows, all of it. He shows us that all of that was preparing us for Christ, the climactic revelation of God, who is the true ones for all sacrifice. The real suffering servant, the lamb slain, whose blood was shed once for all for his people. He's been teaching us that this one is the true prophet, priest, and king. He is the true eternal priest, high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, who has offered his once for all sacrifice, namely himself. He's now been raised with the power of an indestructible life. He has ascended into the heavenly temple above as a priest. He sat down at the right hand of God as king. And he saves to the uttermost by his word and spirit all who come to him. Even though he is out of sight and in heaven, at the right hand of God, ruling and interceding, all in fulfillment, all in climactic fulfillment of the revelation that has come before. He's teaching us that all of God's revelation is of one organic peace as it grows and unfolds, centering around Christ himself in preparation and then in fulfillment. And here is the issue regarding the revelation of God. He is teaching them and then us this lesson about God's unfolding revelation centering around Jesus Christ as the fulfillment because not everyone to whom the author is writing is believing it or receiving this revelation. Some have rejected it, and some are considering going backwards, returning to the types and symbols of the Old Covenant, which is what? It is to reject Christ. Christ, who is the final climactic revelation of God. And what is this rejection of Christ? The Word in whom God has spoken, but unbelief, faithlessness. It is emphatically not to take God at his word, which is the opposite of what faith is. And so the author from the beginning is teaching us that God's revelation is of one piece, like an oak tree moving from seed to sprout and to full bloom and to to prove, to prove that it cannot be received in part. That's what he's doing in the book. He is showing us that we cannot receive in part by faith some of God's revelation, which is what the Hebrews are aiming to do. You see, some of the Hebrews are saying that they receive God's old covenant revelation, but yet they're rejecting Christ, who is the climax of God's revelation. And what he's saying in the book as regards faith and revelation is that we cannot pick and choose which of God's revelation parts we believe or receive. Choosing between the old or new is like choosing between your heart and your brain. And the reason that we receive all or nothing is because if one truly understands the pre-incarnation revelation, the Old Testament, receiving it by faith, they cannot receive Christ, they can't not receive Christ as the fulfillment of it all because it is organically united. And if one receives Christ as fulfillment, by implication, they must see and receive the earlier revelation as preparation because of the organic unity. Or to say it more simply, you can't have a New Testament without an Old Testament. And you can't have an Old Testament without a New Testament. They are indivisible and organically united. And if you properly understand one and believe one, you will believe and receive the other. So you see, the primary issue is the revelation of God and how it's received. Faith 
or unbelief. And this is precisely what Jesus himself teaches us. Not that he's not teaching us in Hebrews, but in John 5, think about what we've said so far and listen to what Jesus says as he speaks to the Jews and their relationship to the old covenant and the revelation that came at many times and in many ways. John 5, 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And then he goes on in 46. He says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You see, Jesus makes it clear there in John 5 that what's really happening in these Jews as they claim to re receive Moses but reject Christ, he's saying this is impossible. If you believed Moses and you don't, you would receive me. You see, Jesus will not let them pick between the old and the new. You get all of it, or you prove to understand none of it. Because he is the point. And therefore, if one receives Moses and his words, we will receive Christ, who is the fulfillment of all of that prophecy. And so we are left with two options. We either receive all or none. We receive Christ and all that prepares the way for Christ, or we reject him and prove that we never truly understood and believed the Old Testament. And that's because the old and new fit together and they cannot be divided. To say it another way, true faith in the book of Hebrews follows the contours of redemptive history all the way up to the peak of the mountain where Christ is as the climax and true saving faith rests there. That is the way that faith and revelation are related in the book of Hebrews. But you might have noticed that we have moved now from taking God at his word in general, which is what we said faith is in Hebrews 11, 1. We have moved from there to taking God at his word specifically in relation to Jesus Christ as Savior. Have you seen that? From God's word generally considered to Jesus Christ specifically. And that is the distinction between general faith and specific faith. And that is a distinction that we find in our own standards. Confession 14.2. Listen to this. See if you see these two parts. By this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word. See how general that is? Right. For the authority of God himself speaking therein and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith, now we're zooming in, are accepting, receiving, and rest, resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. You see, the divines distinguish there between faith general and faith particular or faith specific. Faith as it believes whatever is revealed in the word in total, and saving faith as it accepts, receives, and rests upon Christ alone for salvation. But even though there's a distinction, surely we can see that if faith takes God at his word 
generally in regard to all that's included in it, then faith, the same faith, must accept, receive, and rest upon Christ, the Supreme Son, alone for salvation, because God himself in this word, which we are to receive, has said that this Messiah is the goal of all his revelation. That this Messiah is the only mediator between God and man. That this mediator, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life, apart from whom no one can come to the Father, apart from whom there can be no peace with God. In the word that we are to take generally, all of it, God says That this Messiah, who is the climax of his revelation, is the one who has all that we need for salvation. In his active and passive obedience, his humiliation and exaltation. That his blood is the only blood that forgives sins and only through Christ as mediator can we be reconciled to God. And therefore, do you see, to reject Christ is the epitome of not taking God at his word. It is flagrant unbelief. And those who reject Christ, by necessary consequence, reject all of God's revelation and therefore die in unbelief, not inheriting the land of promise, heaven, where Christ is. But instead, as Scripture says, Revelation 21 the cowardly, the faithless, The detestable as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Therefore, faith as it relates to Christ, who is the centerpiece of Revelation and of Hebrews, Faith as it relates to Christ, the gospel, and salvation is a specific application or element of taking God at his word as he speaks. And if we understand this, we will see that with one swing of the double-edged sword, we've struck down the unbelieving Jews who claim to believe that the Old Testament is the word of God. They don't understand the Old Testament, brothers and sisters. This is why Paul says there's a veil over their face, 2 Corinthians 3. Think about that for a moment. John Owen points this out in his volume 7 of the Crossway edition of his works, at least. He says that they are the greatest in light of grammatical and historical interpretation of the Old Testament. They know the grammar better than anyone else, and they know their own history better than anyone else. And yet, they do not understand the Old Testament because they do not see that Christ is the fulfillment. We have struck down the unbelieving Jews who claim to understand the old while rejecting the new, and we have struck down the Marcionites in modern forms like Andy Stanley who want to hold to the new while being unhitched from the old. The author of Hebrews has proven that both of these paths are unbelief. True faith receives the entire revelation of God from start to finish, and specifically the one who is at the center of all God's revelation, the climactic point, namely Jesus Christ. You see, that is the fundamental issue in the book of Hebrews, isn't it? That God's revelation has come to its climax, and some of these Hebrews are rejecting it while claiming to be God's people. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that you get all of God's revelation, which ends in receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you don't understand any of God's revelation. The point is very simple. Not only have we seen how we are to understand the Bible as a whole, as it leads us to Jesus Christ, seeing how he is the center 
and point of all God's revelation. But we have now seen how we are to respond to the totality of God's revelation, namely by faith. We as God's people are to believe and receive everything that God says in his word, rightly interpreted and understood. This means we do not get to pick and choose from the Bible what we receive and believe and live by as God's people. That was what the Hebrews were doing. At least those who were rejecting the new while claiming to hold to the old. They were refusing to receive and believe the final revelation as it concerns Christ. And by doing this, they reject all of God's revelation. And Jesus himself calls this unbelief in John 5. We cannot pick and choose, but we must take God at his whole word. And even though that might sound so duh, you understand that that is the fundamental issue in the church and in our culture. It is the fundamental issue of man. Why do I say that? Because this is not some problem new to the Hebrews, is it? It's not some problem new to you, is it? Where you read a Bible verse and you think, I don't really want to do that. Only men can be elders in the church? Right? We, we are not the only ones who have wrestled, struggled with receiving God's entire revelation. But this is something that goes all the way back to the garden, is it not? Is this not always where the serpent strikes? This connection between faith and revelation, taking God at his word or not? You see, it was in the garden before sin, sin and man at least. In the garden, it's where we have the first man, Adam, our father and federal head, who received a word from God. Voss calls it pre-redemptive special revelation, particularly Genesis 2.17. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat, you will surely die. That's the revelation of God. And what can Adam do? He can either take God at his word, receiving that word, or he can reject it. And it's here where the serpent comes, questioning and contradicting. Did God really say Adam is here confronted with a test. Will Adam by faith take God at his word for God's sake while being tempted and confronted by the serpent or will he reject God's word revelation in unbelief as he submits to the serpent, a beast that he was to have dominion over? That was the issue. G.I. Williamson in his wonderful commentary in the Confession says Adam's first sin was an attempt to have truth apart from God's, apart from subjection to the word of God. It was to live apart from the light of God's revelation. It was for Adam to reject God's revelation and to live in a different way. And the result is that our federal head, Adam, he took us into sin and misery and into unbelief. And this is why now all mankind, by nature, rejects the word of God. This is why Paul can say that the gospel, the revelation of God to man, it's foolishness. This is why people reject the virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ, Christ as the Son of God, and everything else the scripture teaches. It is ultimately unbelief. It's the result of being dead in sin and blind in Adam. And so the problem isn't new to the Hebrews. It's not new to you and I, but it is ancient, going all the way back to the garden. And therefore, it's not something that we can remedy on our own. And therefore, we need a Savior. And God in his grace sent another Adam figure who instead of doing what the first Adam did... What did the second and last Adam do? 
Did he not live by every word that came from the mouth of God, even when tempted by the same serpent? This is the one who is called the author and perfecter of our faith. Doing what we could never do. He was the perfect pilgrim who held fast to the word of his father, the revelation of his father, even in the wilderness, even while being tempted, being obedient, even to the point of death with his eyes on glory, now raised and ascended into that very promised glory. And this is the one to whom we must be united if we are to be forgiven. Heirs of eternal life, life and kingdom hidden in heaven, unseen and hoped for. And surely, if we believe the word of God concerning Christ and the gospel and our need of salvation, then we will believe all of God's word as it points us to Christ, puts forth Christ and teaches us what we must believe and how we are to live as God's blood-bought, spirit-filled people. So brothers and sisters, let us as God's people, united to Christ by spirit-wrought faith, receive and believe the totality of the revelation of God at every point and in every way. Let us not, like some of the Hebrews, pick and choose what we will believe and receive from the word of God. But let us see that all scripture, Paul says, is inspired making us wise into salvation, and that it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that we might be equipped for every good work. Let us spend our lives taking God at his word, all of it, receiving it with faith and love, laying it up in our hearts, and practicing it in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.